Thank you, and it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here to talk to you about an important topic. It's one that uh, many people don't like to think about. It's a bit scary when you think about it, um, but uh, I think that's all the more reason why it's important to think about it and talk about it. And I uh, look forward, uh, after my remarks, to having some questions from you. And, uh, and I hope that some of them are very pointed and, and challenging, uh, because uh, I think anything less would, would be um, <clears throat> to do a disservice to this wonderful venue and this wonderful way of uh, getting together uh, publicly and talking about important topics of the day. I have to say that uh, I'm, I'm here at the request of the U.S. State Department. They have paid for my travels and are putting me up in some nice hotels and taking me to different cities in India to, to do um, different talks. But they don't tell me what to say. In fact, they, they asked me, what, what are you prepared to talk about? And I gave them uh, several choices of things that I was prepared to talk about. One of them was nuclear weapons and national security, and this is the first audience of which I'm getting a chance to do that. So I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful that after having spent some time preparing remarks, that I actually get to to talk about them. Um, it's also important to note that uh, that I, I will be in some cases critical of U.S. policy. So what you're getting are one person's views. I don't represent the U.S. government. I'm not speaking on their behalf, and anything that I say should be taken as strictly my personal views, not those of the Department of Defense for which I work or the National War College where I teach. Um, it's strictly my views. Okay, so with that caveat out of the way, let me just note that um, on January 4th, 2007, a little more than nine years ago, four prominent Americans joined in the chorus of voices calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons. Former Secretaries of State George Shultz and Henry, Henry Kissinger joined former Defense Secretary William Perry and former Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee Sam Nunn to produce an opinion piece which was published in the Wall Street Journal titled, A World Free of Nuclear Weapons. Now these men, who all had held positions of high responsibility in the U.S. government, were hardly your typical nuclear abolitionists. So their op-ed piece garnered a lot of attention. A year later, on January 15, 2008, they published another similar article in the Wall Street Journal. This one was titled, Toward a Nuclear Free World. 2008 was the same year, of course, that Barack Obama was elected to the White House and became America's 44th president in January of 2009 when he took the oath of office. And as all of you know, he wasted no time in acting to diminish the perceived threat from nuclear weapons. Within three months of taking office in April of 2009, President Obama delivered his famous Prague speech uh, calling for the abolition of nuclear weapons. And in 2010, the Department of Defense completed the most recent nuclear posture review, which listed five objectives. And these objectives were unique, I think, in nuclear posture reviews. The first one was preventing nuclear proliferation or nuclear terrorism. Now, the reason the United States conducts nuclear posture reviews is because at the d direction of the U.S. Congress, it's supposed to figure out what the force structure of America's nuclear arsenal will look like. And so for the first objective to be preventing nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism was, I think, um, a new step in nuclear posture reviews. The second objective of the Nuclear Posture Review of 2010 was, quote, reducing the role of U.S. nuclear weapons in U.S. national security strategy. And the third objective was maintaining strategic deterrence and stability at reduced nuclear force levels. There were five objectives total, and the fourth one was strengthening regional deterrence and reassuring U.S. allies and partners. But as became clear over the next year, that had nothing to do with the U.S. nuclear arsenal. That was about strengthening deterrence through conventional forces and ballistic missile defenses. And only when you get to the fifth and final objective of the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review do you get sustaining a safe, secure, and effective nuclear arsenal. So what normally would have been the first objective was relegated to the very last objective in the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review. And I think what this indicates was that President Obama was very serious about acting on his Prague agenda. 
and moving out in terms of trying to reduce the role of nuclear weapons and reduce the numbers of nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal. Well, a year later, uh, President Obama signed and it ratified the New START agreement between the United States and Russia, limiting each to no more than 1,500 and 50 warheads um, and certain numbers of, of delivery vehicles, which we can get into. I won't bore you with the details right now unless you want to talk about those. Um, so the two countries have until 2018 to implement that agreement, and after that the treaty is supposed to stand in force for up to 10 years. Moving ahead to 2013, in June of 2013, just a few months after President Obama took the oath of office for a second time, after he was reelected, he gave a speech in Berlin in which he again repeated uh, his desire to see a world free of nuclear weapons. And at the same time that he was making this speech in Berlin, the White House released a fact sheet titled, quote, Nuclear Weapons Employment Strategy of the United States. So a public document with a title like that. And according to the White House statement, this presidential announcement was, quote, the latest in a series of concrete steps the president has made to advance his Prague agenda and the long-term goal of achieving the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. The press release also stated that, quote, after a comprehensive review of our nuclear forces, the president has determined that we can ensure the security of the United States and our allies and partners and maintain a strong and credible strategic deterrent while safely pursuing up to one-third reduction in deployed strategic nuclear weapons from the level established in the New START Treaty. So just a few years previously, they had set the number at around 1,500, and now here they are saying that we can go down to by a third, so roughly around 1,000 strategic nuclear warheads. Um, for those who knew how to read between the lines, the White House fact sheet edged ever closer to an open declaration that the sole purpose of America's nuclear weapons was to deter uh, nuclear attacks. And while that may not seem remarkable, that is a statement uh, that had been urged strongly for the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review by some people in the administration, but was not adopted. Um, the, the White House press release further noted that, quote, the U.S. intent is to seek negotiated cuts with Russia so we can continue to move beyond Cold War nuclear postures. Well, in the two and a half years since then, the Russians have made it very clear that they are not interested in further nuclear reductions. Um, the year 2013 also saw some press reports about the retirement of uh, nuclear weapon systems, including the uh, Tomahawk land attack missile, uh, the nuclear version of that, or TLAM-N as it's referred to. And the following years, 2014 and 2015, the United States helped lead the P5 plus one talks with Iran, resulting in the recent joint comprehensive plan of action. And a just a couple of weeks ago, on January 16th of this year, the P5 plus one and Iran declared uh, implementation day, marking the, the point at which Iran is deemed to have taken the necessary steps for lifting of sanctions related to its nuclear program. And as you know, this plan is intended to forestall Iran's becoming a nuclear power, to increase the breakout time from a few months to a full year should Iran decide to rush to produce nuclear weapons, and it significantly restricts Iran from enriching uranium or producing plutonium for the next 10 years. Now, uh, I scarcely need to remind this audience that not all developments in the realm of nuclear weapons have been worthy of celebration or hope for a better tomorrow. Um, as you may know, uh, the Indian general, K. Sundarji, reportedly claimed as a key lesson of the first Gulf War that uh, the lesson was, don't fight the United States unless you have nuclear weapons. And this highlights a very important point. Countries get nuclear weapons for their own reasons, for their own security, and for reasons that have nothing to do with the size or shape of the U.S. arsenal. And so perhaps it should be no surprise that as the United States has cut its nuclear arsenal from the Cold War uh, height by approximately 85%. This has done nothing to stop certain countries from pursuing nuclear weapons. Um, in fact, advances in America's conventional warfighting capabilities probably 
do more to incentivize states that feel threatened by America to try to get nuclear weapons uh, than anything that America is doing with its own nuclear arsenal. One of the texts that I use in an elective that I teach on nuclear weapons and national security in the 21st century is by an Indian author, uh, Muthia Alagapa. His book, The Long Shadow, Nuclear Weapons and Security in 21st Century Asia. And I choose to use this book because it's useful for our American students to realize that the current nuclear abolition movement that is so popular in the United States and parts of Western Europe um, doesn't really play that well in other parts of the world. And it's important for them to understand why that's the case. In America, it's popular to believe that with the end of the Cold War, we can stop worrying about nuclear weapons, get rid of these useless, dangerous things, and move on. Well, it's not such a, a rosy uh, picture as that. Um, and May 25th of 2009, just about 50 days after President Obama gave his Prague speech, North Korea conducted its second nuclear test, and arguably its first successful nuclear test, then on February 12th, 2013, less than a month after President Obama was sworn in for a second time as President of the United States, North Korea helped celebrate that by conducting its third nuclear test. Last year, North Korea claimed to have missiles that could, were capable of hitting the United States. And last month, Pyongyang detonated yet another nuclear device, claiming that it was a thermonuclear weapon. And of course, as you all know, just two days ago, uh, actually just one day ago, right? It was yesterday. That, um, that it launched another rocket, which uh, many see as a stalking horse for a ballistic missile program and nothing to do with a space program. So concerns about North Korea's nuclear weapons capability have led serious commentators and even some political leaders in South Korea and Japan to talk openly about the possibility of those countries producing their own nuclear arsenals, which 10 years ago would have been utterly taboo in a country like Japan. But now, serious people are talking about that. And in fact, both South Korea and Japan processing plants um, that could, in addition to producing fuel for nuclear reactors, also be used to produce fissile material for bombs. And it is that potential that has caused the United States to urge South Korea and Japan against that course of action. Uh, it remains to be seen. I believe at this at this point in time, Japan has gone forward with plutonium separation uh, facilities, and South Korea is still considering them, but has not moved on that. And while we can all take some comfort in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action limiting Iran's ability to produce fissile material, we should not forget that more than four years ago, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, reported through its its uh, governor or through its um, uh, Governor General to the IAEA Board of Governors, that Iran had essentially done everything needed to produce a nuclear weapon except gain access to the fissile material. It had done explosive testing on spherical devices, essentially implosion testing. There's no point to doing that unless you're producing a nuclear weapon. And they had tested that same um, design on the Shahab-3 missile and used airburst fusing. There was evidence of testing of airburst fusing. This was all in a UN IAEA report, um, and so the only conclusion that uh, that they felt that could be drawn was that Iran did, in fact, have a very active nuclear weapons program, wanted nuclear weapons, and the only thing that was keeping them from actually having nuclear weapons was the lack of fissile material, and of course, they were moving out on that with uranium enrichment, and it seemed like uh, not a year went by when there was some revelation of some Iranian activity that was beyond the non-proliferation treaty, which they had signed up to. Um, and so I think the world was rightly concerned. And while we should be happy about the, the joint comprehensive uh, agreement, um, we should not forget um, what led to it. And Iran's neighbors certainly won't forget. Uh, many of them have been seen to be hedging towards nuclear programs of their own through uh, nuclear energy programs in places like Saudi Arabia, which people would ask why, why a country so uh, rich in energy would want to have a nuclear energy program. But um, Saudi Arabia has been perhaps most vocal in stating that 
it is not happy to live in a world where Iran has nuclear weapons without having its own countervailing nuclear weapons. And of course, Turkey and Egypt are also countries that uh, have been mentioned as probably no longer willing to forego their own nuclear weapons in a world where Iran has gained nuclear weapons. Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip over some developments in the START Treaty. I'll just merely highlight the fact that while the U.S. has been aggressively building down its strategic arsenals to come into agreement with the, the New START agreement, um, the Russians have actually built up. And so, whereas the U.S., um, as of 2011, when, when the, uh, the treaty went into force, had an advantage in strategic warheads of something like 250 more warheads than the Russians had. Uh, we have drawn down to below the treaty limits already, even though we're not required to do so by 2018. The Russians, who were just a little bit above the treaty limits uh, in, in 2011, are now a little bit more above the treaty limits. They've actually added warheads to their arsenal. And the net exchange, the U.S. has gone from being 250 or so uh, warheads above what the Russians had to now more than 100 warheads fewer than what the Russians have. So there's been a net change of over 300 warheads um, in favor of Russia. So um, I'm not sure that we had exactly the same thing in mind in trying to get to the, the new START agreement. Uh, um, let me just point out, though, that since the end of the Cold War, Russia has fielded two new ICBMs. Um, and is developing a new heavy ICBM to replace the SS-18 uh, ballistic missile. And indeed, Russia, as the National Institute for Public Policy put it, is, quote, embarked massive strategic modernization program, nu new nuclear weapons and delivery systems. And this massive, and that's the end of the quote, but this massive buildup, I should point out, includes all legs of Russia's nuclear triad. Moreover, Russia has engaged in disturbingly aggressive and irresponsibly provocative behavior with regard to its nuclear weapons. In an interview in 2015, anniversary of Russia's annexation of Crimea, Russian president told reporters that he was ready to put Russia's nuclear forces on alert in the run-up annexation of Crimea, and that nuclear weapons could have been used if others attempted to interfere in the annexation. So Putin's comments seem to imply what all but the most ardent Russophiles already knew, the annexation of Crimea and naked act of aggression. But what shocked many observers most was that Russia was thinking of using nuclear weapons to ensure that that annexation was carried out. And in the year since then, Russia has flown its bombers towards U.S. airspace and to the airspace of NATO countries. And the number and provocative nature of such flights actually exceeds what we saw in the Cold War. They've uh, flown what are obviously cruise missile delivery programs. And in Northern Europe, they've flown their bombers, their nuclear-capable bombers, uh, without their transponders turned on that the air traffic controllers can use to keep these bombers clear of civilian airliners. And on one occasion, at least, it was alleged that they flew with actual nuclear weapons on board their bombers. In a series of Russian military exercises, NATO, Russia has openly and repeatedly exercised the first use of tactical nuclear weapons against NATO. And he's been exercised its strategic nuclear forces. And again, citing the report from the National Institute for Public Policy, quote, in August 2014, the U.S. State Department formally declared Moscow to be uh, in violation of its obligations under the INF, or Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, uh, something we can talk about. Finally, Vladimir Putin and senior Russian military officers have repeatedly made highly provocative nuclear threats against the United States and its NATO allies, and Poland has particularly been singled out for such unwanted attention because merely it agreed to host portions of a U.S. European-based missile defense system on its soil. China has a long-term, wide-ranging nuclear modernization program involving the land-based systems and sea-based legs of its triad. And unlike Russia, China has been much quieter. Okay. 
Should we turn this one off? No, I think unless you want to hold it. No, that's a good point. Okay. So China has had a very aggressive modernization program, although it talks less openly about that. Um, and so we really don't know exactly what what China has, um, and that has led people to speculate uh, that the Chinese nuclear arsenal ranges from a few hundred warheads to a few thousand. And while less vociferous in their nuclear threats, China has periodically threatened to annihilate U.S. cities with such weapons should the United States ever come to the defense of Taiwan or otherwise find itself at a war with China. So now let me move on to South Asia. As the author Paul Bracken, writing in 2000 in the pages of Foreign Affairs magazine, noted, 1998 was not only the 500th anniversary of Vasco da Gama's landing in India, marking the start of an era of Western dominance in Asia, 1998 also saw India detonate five atomic bombs, followed by a similar flurry of nuclear explosions by Pakistan. Bracken's article was titled, The Second Nuclear Age. And he later developed his thinking and published a book by the same title in 2012. And Bracken persuasively argues that the American strategists and the Obama administration in particular wish to consign nuclear weapons to history and ignore their relevance for today and for the future. And that even as multipolar nuclear world emerges and is shaping strategic thinking in South Asia. Many American strategists uh, or many uh, many American strategists engage in disarmament and non-proliferation fantasies and fail to accept the reality that nuclear weapons matter enormously to some countries and they are not going away anytime soon. In a book review of the second nuclear age by Walter Russell Mead of the Council on Foreign Relations, Mead noted that, quote, Bracken's analysis of the role of nuclear weapons in the India-Pakistan rivalry is disturbing and illuminating. The two sides haven't used their weapons, but their arsenals have changed their military and political strategies in ways that make the region more explosive and crisis-prone. Pakistan, unable to compete in conventional weapons with its larger and wealthier neighbor, is expanding the quantity, upgrading the quality, and diversifying the designs of its arsenal. India, meanwhile, is investing heavily in capabilities that would allow it to spot Pakistan's preparations for a nuclear strike and possibly preempt with force. The American scholar Paul Kapoor, a professor in the Department of National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School, has for years been highlighting the potential dangers for nuclear escalation in South Asia. The danger, according to Kapoor, is that while India and Pakistan have managed to avoid using nuclear weapons despite conflicts and crises since 1998, the two sides have drawn different conclusions about how deterrence works. And their different conclusions are reflected in their different strategies and force postures, and that these developments increase the chances for nuclear escalation in the future. From the 1999 Cargill conflict and the 2001-2002 crisis following the terrorist attacks on the Indian parliament, India learned, or so the thinking goes, that it could conduct or threaten robust conventional military operations in a conflict with Pakistan. As long as India showed sufficient restraint, it could avoid crossing any Pakistani red lines that would trigger Pakistan's use of nuclear weapons. Pakistan, on the other hand, supposedly learned that its nuclear weapons, and importantly, its willingness to be the first to use them, has deterred India from responding to acts of military aggression and subconventional provocations. Thus, in a future crisis or conflict, India would believe that it could attack Pakistan with conventional military forces without triggering a nuclear response from Pakistan, so long as India made clear that its objectives were sufficiently limited and did not threaten the existence of the Pakistani state or the complete destruction of the Pakistani military. Pakistan, having fielded battlefield nuclear weapons, especially the or had if nine could easily perceive a much more th serious threat than India intended and decide to use one or more of the battlefield nuclear weapons um, or a field commander in possession of battlefield nuclear weapons might use them if he was in imminent danger of being overrun and facing the prospects of losing those battlefield nuclear weapons to advancing Indian forces. That would leave Indian leaders in the terrible position of deciding whether to withdraw after being attacked 
with a Pakistani battlefield nuclear weapon, or whether to respond, and if the decision were to respond, then how? With massive retaliation according to India's declaratory policy, or propor proportionately, perhaps leaving Pakistan to escalate? And if one side or the other believed that nuclear escalation was inevitable and that a disarming first strike could come at any moment, then there would be an enormous incentive to not be the second party to leash an all-out nuclear attack. Thus, whether India has a cold start doctrine, as some allege or not, doesn't really matter. The question is how far India can go in responding to Pakistani aggression or provocations without, risk without risking escalation across the nuclear threshold. And can anyone control escalation once that threshold has been crossed and with such powerful incentives uh, to preempt the other side's potential for a nuclear first strike? Will India missile defenses in the future help reduce the threat of nuclear use or nuclear escalation, or will it make it more likely? Of course, no one knows for sure, but there is a logic to that, that says that a minimal missile defense capability would tend to be stabilizing, but that a robust missile defense um, capability would not, that it would actually be destabilizing. So the thinking goes, a minimal missile defense capability would guard against accidental or unauthorized attack um, without necessarily making Pakistan feel that it needed to engage in a nuclear arms buildup to overwhelm uh, Indian defenses. And thus, the minimal missile defense system should prove destabilizing in peacetime and in times of crises. Another argument against a more robust Indian missile defense system is that it is destabilizing because inherent in such a system is the possibility that India could attempt a disarming nuclear first strike against Pakistan and rely on its missile defenses to protect India from the remaining Pakistani nuclear weapons that survived the first strike. With this possibility in mind, Pakistan um, would, in a nuclear crisis, have an enormous incentive to attempt its own first strike, overwhelming India's defenses and neutralizing India's offensive capabilities before India could strike first. If we recall that stability is all about removing incentives to be the first to cross the nuclear threshold, and especially about removing incentives to launch large-scale nuclear strikes, then perhaps a more robust missile defense system would be self-defeating. And An absolutely ironclad, impervious missile shield is probably not realistic today or in the near future. But even if India could develop such a system, it might well not protect against aircraft delivering nuclear weapons or other types of delivery systems. Thus, some argue that India should field a minimum missile defense system, but not a robust one. I personally do not agree with that argument. I'm more inclined to believe that effective air defense and missile defense systems not only help deter attacks, uh, but they help to defend in the case where deterrence breaks down and fails. If deterrence does fail, one has to consider what is the value of defending even one Indian city or one military installation. And of course, there are other ways, even with a missile defense system, for India to signal that it did not have uh, aggressive intentions and had no intentions of a, a first strike. One of those being maintaining India's current posture, its current no first use doctrine, and its policy of not mating its warheads to its missile system because it's impossible, of course, to carry out a first strike with such a posture. Um, but as we move forward into the future, as India fields the Ariant uh, SSBN, or, or ballistic missile submarine, and as Pakistan uh, fields the, the Hadith 9, or Nasser battlefield nuclear missile, uh, I'm not sure that that posture can be maintained anymore, because you can't put submarines to sea as part of your nuclear deterrent without the missiles on board. And there's no such, there's no use to a battlefield nuclear system that isn't mated to, to its warheads. Um, so uh, the future certainly holds some challenges in that regard. And in addition, India has China to consider. And even a modest missile defense capability against China would appear to Pakistan to be a very robust missile defense system uh, in any case. Let me just uh, touch on the non-proliferation treaty briefly here uh, as a conclusion. And then we can open it up to, to your questions and thoughts. Um, in his political campaign to become the President of the United States, then Senator John F. Kennedy 
uh, in, in 1960 warned that, quote, there are indications because of new inventions that 10, 15, or 20 nations will have a nuclear capability, including Red China, by the end of the presidential office in 1964. This is extremely serious. I think the fate not only of our own civilization, but I think the fate of the world and the future of the human race is involved in preventing a nuclear war. Again, that was John F. Kennedy in October of 1960. Yet here we are, more than 55 years later, more than half a century after Kennedy's forecast, and there are just nine countries that possess nuclear weapons, fewer than Kennedy's lowest estimate of the number that would have nuclear weapons by 1964. So regardless of what one thinks about the fairness of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or NPT, it is more commonly known, the Treaty and the Nuclear Suppliers Group have, I think, help to limit the spread of nuclear weapons technology and to limit the number of nuclear weapons states. Clearly, the NPT is not perfect. Uh, three countries refused to sign the treaty, including Israel, India, and Pakistan, and all instead decided to go ahead and pursue nuclear weapons technology, and today all possess nuclear weapons of their own. Um, also, We've had countries such as um, North Korea and Iran who used the treaty to gain nuclear weapons technology. The basic bargain of the treaty, as you know, is that states that did not have nuclear weapons when the treaty went into force and that signed on to the treaty agreed that they would never develop nuclear weapons. And in exchange for that promise, they were given complete access to civilian nuclear energy technology. And in the case, as I said, of, of North Korea and Iran, they used that access to nuclear technology that they gained by signing the NPT. And in total contravention of the treaty, they went ahead and developed their own nuclear weapons program. But despite its failings, the NPT and the complementary nuclear suppliers group have exercised a significant role, I believe, in curbing the spread of nuclear weapons. It's my strong belief that they should continue to do so. Uh, now, contrary to some realist belief who argue that proliferation is a good thing, that it forces countries to sober up when they have nuclear weapons and uh, makes them more cautious, um, I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest uh, that that might not be the case. And that perhaps the United States and the Soviet Union were more lucky than good during the Cold War, that it didn't turn out in quite a different way. So I'm not one who believes that proliferation is stabilizing. And what's different today from the Cold War is, whereas in the Cold War it was the superpowers who developed nuclear arsenals and other major powers, today we see countries ex developing nuclear uh, arsenals or expanding nuclear arsenals that are at-risk countries, uh, very weak countries, poor countries, and even potentially failed states. And I would put North Korea in that category, and potentially even uh, Pakistan. I would also point out that it took the United States and the Soviet Union over a decade to come up with the safeguards to prevent accidental or unauthorized use of nuclear weapons. And I would ask you to contemplate how long will it take Iran should it get a nuclear weapon to come up with some, such safeguards? How long will it take North Korea to come up with such safeguards? And what is the state of such safeguards in India and Pakistan today? There was an article last month in Foreign Policy magazine that suggested that India needed to do a much better job in safeguarding its nuclear materials, its nuclear sites, and in vetting the people that are responsible for nuclear security. This is very serious business, and it needs to be treated that way. Finally, let me just note, perhaps um, somewhat controversially, Maybe this will spark some discussion in the Q&A. But I'm going to, to assert that the NPD, the, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, does not really commit the United States or any of its signatories to nuclear disarmament. It's a very popular notion that the U.S. has somehow not lived up to the NPT because it hasn't gotten rid of all of its nuclear weapons after all these years. Um, I would say... Uh, the, the part of the NPT that talks to nuclear disarmament is Article 6. 
And if you give it a close reading, you will find out that it is so heavily caveated, the language, that it's practically meaningless. It reads, and I'll quote, Each party undertakes to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date to nuclear disarmament. And then it goes on to say, and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international controls. That second part of the sentence isn't about nuclear weapons. That's all weapons. I mean, this is a bit pie-in-the-sky stuff, really. Right? We're going to get rid of all weapons, and under international control, nobody's going to have any weapons. But the first part is the part that says we're going to do certain things towards nuclear disarmament, the first part of that sentence. But if you parse the language, uh, as undoubtedly U.S. State Department lawyers did before asking the president to sign up to this, you find that at best the first part of the statement merely commits the signatories to make some effort towards negotiations on measures relating to. And I think we've done that. We've, we've had lots of good negotiations on measures relating to nuclear disarmament. So we can check that block and say we have completely fulfilled um, our obligations under the treaty. We did our end the nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union. And in fact, we've gotten rid of 85% of the arsenal that we once had. Um, so I, for one, uh, am not one to, to bash the U.S. too much for not getting rid of its last nuclear weapons as of this day. Um, and recall, the treaty is the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, or more formally, the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. It is not the Treaty on the Disarmament of Nuclear Weapons. So... Um, We've talked about the basic bargain of the NPT, and it, it acknowledges nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. Um, since 2008, I would say India has been a special case. It's neither part of the NPT, nor is it any longer ostracized for not, for not being part of the NPT. It's sort of in this middle ground. And Pakistan has argued for similar treatment. However, given Pakistan's atrocious proliferation record, specifically the case of Dr. A.Q. Khan, um, the possibility that Pakistan might someday be treated in a fashion similar to India should be considered a remote, long-term possibility con contingent on strict, proven, non-proliferation behavior. Um, I think, it, too, if you read the, the terms of the non-proliferation treaty, it is very, very difficult to amend the treaty in any significant way. And so there are those who say, well, now that we've got this civilian nuclear deal and we're talking about the U.S. is supporting India's accession to the nuclear suppliers group, uh, why don't we just treat India as a, a nuclear weapon state under the NPT? Well, you can't. By definition, you can't. And to change the NPT would require China's consent. And I think at the moment that seems remote. So normally I would, uh, would maybe conclude a longer talk by going through some nuclear myths that I, I think are out there and dispelling them. But I think in the interest of time and wanting to shift from my talking to hearing what's on your mind, and giving you a chance to, to challenge me and engage in some question and answer. Um, I'll stop there, and if the, the, uh, the nuclear myths come up by a result of your question and answers, then, uh, then we'll get to those. That was very nice. Very Thank you. Thank you. So how do we proceed? Is there a, a yeah. microphone to, to pass around? Thank you very much, Dr. Mm -hmm. That was a very nice talk. It's all yours. Uh, Before you start with your questions, uh, I just thought we'll make a couple of announcements. Next Saturday, we have uh, Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan of uh, uh, Tata Motors earlier and one of the uh, uh, finest thinkers and uh, uh, authors who will come and talk. The talk is uh, held at Vidyaranya. So do come next Saturday. 29th, we have our annual budget analysis meeting at the Second Abad Club. Um, make it a point to come on the 29th at the club. Immediately after that, on the 1st, we have a meet here where uh, we'll be discussing antibiotic resistance, a very important issue for all of us. So, unfortunately, we couldn't space it out because we had people coming in from out of town. And so, you'll be uh, uh, here once again on the 1st of March. So there are three uh, events that are lined up, but before that we have Dr. Bucknam with us uh, on this. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi there. Uh, thanks for the enlightening talk. My question was uh, about uh, uh, the cold start doctrine, which you talked about. You mentioned uh, Krishna Swami Sundarji, who more or less was the godfather of bringing that to after uh, Operation Brass Tax. Do you think that's uh, made India any safer with respect to the nuclear arms race or uh, just ge or, or, or overall security in general? I mean, a skeptic would probably say no, uh, considering all the attacks that have gone on ever since uh, Operation uh, Brass Tax from, from across the border. So I just wanted your insight on uh, the Cold Start Doctrine and how, that's, how, if at all, that's made India more safer. So um, acknowledging that uh, the Indian government and military have publicly not admitted to having a cold start doctrine, um, I'll work on the assumption that perhaps within the army that was uh, a considered doctrine for a while, and perhaps it was exercised, as some people have reported. Um, I know um, recently I've heard people who say mm, it hasn't really been fully implemented um, but let's just go, I think you, the, the question was asked in the spirit, would such a doctrine really help um, India? Um, I think it's a, it was a sensible doctrine. What I understand of, of the Cold Start Doctrine, um, it really does make a lot of sense. Um, countries that have um, neighbors who potentially could find themselves in conflict with India, um, right there on their borders, can't afford to ha take 30 days to mobilize. Right? Uh, you really can't. Um, the, the, the readier that your forces are, the more they act as a deterrent. So the, the greater the chance that you won't actually have to use them, right? Because any potential aggressor sees that readiness and knows that there will be a quick uh, response. So in some ways, having a cold start doctrine makes sense. Also, it made sense because it, it wasn't just how you postured the forces. It was the intent behind them and the strategy that goes with it. The old doctrine uh, counted on um, strike corps deep within India, mobilizing, moving up to the border, but then essentially cutting Pakistan in half, which Pakistan would see as a, as a serious threat to the, to the existence of the state. Right? Um, and so India needed something... And I, I certainly understand the, the leadership within the Indian Army feeling that it needed to be able to offer civilian leaders other options besides, you know, just sit there and take it and do nothing or, you know, risk full-on war with Pakistan and that, that Pakistan could perceive as a, a, a existential threat to the state, and which would clearly cross the red line. The Cold Star Doctrine addressed that problem by having multiple smaller units that could... Um, hit and achieve more limited objectives, either to teach Pakistan a le lesson or to grab some territory that it could then negotiate uh, over in the aftermath of it. So I think it makes sense. I think it potentially could um, could make India safer. Um, but there is this question about the lessons that the two sides have drawn from crises since 1998. And the big concern is that, you know, Pakistan has spelled out some, some notional red lines in terms of territory, in terms of destruction of its military, in terms of blockade and, and damage to its economy. Um, but those are very ambiguous as to exactly where those lie. And it's quite possible that India could take action very rapidly before others could intervene. Right? That's part of the idea supposedly behind the Cold Star Doctrine was um, one of the things that happened as a result of taking so long to mobilize was that Pakistan counter-mobilized and being a smaller country was able to move forces to the border with India. And outside powers such as the U.S. and others in the U.N. Uh, put pressure on India not to do anything. And it's argued that the Indian military was convinced that the civil government lost its nerve. And this is where the Cold Start gets to be problematic because if Cold Start is intended to get a reaction in the heat of the moment after an attack and to do it so that action becomes sort of preordained and, and there isn't a chance to change your mind, um, maybe that's uh, not, not the best thing. Maybe that's not the best thing, which may explain why no Indian 
government has embraced the idea or admitted to having one. Maybe it was an idea that the Army thought was good for good and sufficient reason, but which um, the, the negative aspects of it were all too obvious to the political leader. Uh, a very articulate presentation, Mr. Buck uh, Bucknam. I'm, I do not know enough about the NPT to probe you on that. I'm a professor of management, and I look at uh, international relations purely from a strategy point of view. Long before 20, uh, 2001, uh, main, mainstream journalists in the U.S. like Farid Zakaria, Seymour Hirsch, Bob Woodward had talked about the dangers of uh, American democratizing zeal and mis mission. Uh, they have this great uh, idea of supplanting uh, liberal democracies across the world. We have seen the, 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 uh, the flip side of that philosophy in Syria and other places. I'm reminded of Win what Winston Churchill had said about America. He said, the Americans always do the right thing, but only after doing everything else. Right. And the issue is, uh, ha have some of these lessons been learned? Because uh, you, there is chaos in the Middle East. I'm not going to assign uh, any kind of blame here, but when something happens in Syria, it's the Western Europe which gets affected, not America. So there is a, a moat that America has in the, form, in the form of the Pacific Ocean, which, which gives it the advantage of some kind of uh, isolation, whereas the rest of the world doesn't have that. So the less, have the lessons been learned? Yeah. Uh, because, as you know, when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches cold. So, yeah. so I just so, wanted to uh, know your perspective on that. It's, it's, a, it's a terrific question. Um, I think to some degree you see lessons being learned. Um, so we, we, where I teach at the college, we try to, to, to take um, officers who are moving to the senior ranks and teach them to think strategically. And as we teach them how to, to, to develop strategy, we caution them about risks. Risk to their strategy, things that cause their strategy to fail, but also risks from their strategy. Sometimes your strategy succeeds catastrophically in ways you didn't anticipate. And sometimes strategy has second and third order consequences that, that maybe could be foreseen, but, but aren't. Um, I'll come back to the bit about democracy because it's, it was a, a bit involved in the question. But I would say that in, in terms of evidence of learning, um, I don't think what, is, what has transpired in the Middle East was that part of anybody's strategy. Uh, I think actually it was an absence of strategy that led to what we're seeing, including the flight of refugees. Uh, I would argue that in 2011, um, Iraq was in a pretty good place. Um, the Arab Spring had occurred, and that was seen generally as a positive thing uh, around the world. Um, but what, what changed is, one of the things that changed, and I think it had a significant impact, is that the current administration, the Obama administration, uh, came into office having never really supported the war in Iraq, uh, wanting to focus more on Afghanistan uh, and to get out of Iraq. And I think they half-heartedly tried to attempt to negotiate the status of forces agreement that would have kept forces in Iraq. I don't think they really wanted them there. And I think they wanted to use an inability to get the SOFA as an excuse to say, well, we tried, but we, we couldn't. Um, whatever you think of George W. Bush, it, it should be known that he devoted a lot of time and energy personally um, in talks with uh, Maliki in trying to get him to be a responsible leader and to um, make a role within his government and in his society for all different factions, Sunni, Shia, Kurds. Um, and it took a lot of work. It took a lot of leverage, pressure, diplomacy to try to keep Iraq moving in a positive direction. President Obama never devoted that sort of time, energy, and effort. And, and as, as a consequence, we left Iraq. Uh, Maliki very much uh, disenfranchised the non-Shias in Iraq. Um, and um, we had a chance for Islamic State to metastasize and spread back into parts of Sunni Iraq. Um, so I don't th see that as a consequence of an intentional strategy. It is a consequence of uh, events and a failure strategy. Um, but to go back to your original question about learning about spreading democracy, uh, that was something debated a lot in the U.S. Um, and it was the Bush administration's um, strategy to try to foment democracy around the world. Um, 
Many people believe that's a good thing because there's this democratic peace theory that democracies tend not to fight other democracies. I would add, if you just put the word liberal in there, that's mostly true. Liberal democracies tend not to fight liberal democracies. Um, but what is scholarship also shows is that that's for mature democracies, well-rooted democracies. Young democracies are very fragile. Uh, and um, it's not necessarily clear how long it takes to get from overthrowing an authoritarian regime to having a functioning civil society and democracy. Um, so I think many in America today doubt the wisdom of that. There were plenty at the time who challenged it. Uh, even more people would, would uh, doubt the wisdom of it today. Um, I would say that the Obama administration maybe didn't necessarily learn that lesson right away, which is why they were quick to abandon Mubarak in Egypt. Um, in, in favor of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and then it looked like it was going to be one man, one vote, one time. And then they were going to change the Constitution. And, uh, and the Egyptian army stepped in. But we've, we've not been very kind to the Egyptian army since then. Um, so there's part of America, I think, that still wants to try to push its values uh, in, in democracy in other parts of the world. Um, and we don't see that as, as destabilizing. I have a colleague at work who's a Russia area expert. He's an army colonel. And he's, he's been assigned to Moscow. He's been assigned to different parts of the former Soviet Union. And he occasionally gets asked to go speak to the Foreign Service Institute to our young diplomats. Um, and when he does, he likes to go over there and congratulate them on their uh, um, skills at regime change and their, their ability to, to pull that off. And then he, he delivers the punchline, which is he just wishes they were doing it on purpose instead of by accident. Because we don't realize that in, in supporting uh, democracy movements, um, we are very threatening. We are not the status quo power to, to some people. Um, and so uh, maybe we should take that on board. So I, I think it, it, in general we've, we've learned. Um, but I think it's a, a tendency that goes back to Woodrow Wilson. It's a very liberal tendency. It's not necessarily a conservative tendency, right? We joined World War I to make the world safe for democracy. Well, who are we to decide that the world should be safe for democracy or democratic? Right? Um, and yet, it is, a, it is a fairly strong strand in American foreign policy, um, but one in which I think we've taken an appetite suppressant given our recent experience. Uh, you said that you know, the, the decline in the nuclear arsenal, is a, you've shown that it's a good sign. Um, and there's no, I mean, and it spends much more than the next 10 countries put together. So don't you see that as a sign? I mean, what do you believe that is uh, in terms of it keeping its good, the United States keeping its good faith with the rest of the world in terms of, you know, uh, reducing aggression in, in that sense. Yeah, so um, there's the old saying that um, um, if you want peace, prepare for war, right? Um, I mean, a, a country like the United States, if it's weak, that invites aggression. Um, the challenge is to figure out how to strike the right balance, how much defense... Can you afford? Um, how do you use it best so as to encourage and promote stability and peace and not uh, conflict or aggression? Um, but I think that um, this goes back to our, the first uh, national security strategy the U.S. ever had. If you go back before World War II, the U.S. did not have a national security strategy. We were very isolationist. And the first thing we did at the end of World War II was demobilize completely. Went from like 9 million people under arms to less than a million, almost overnight. Just put people out um, and drew down our forces. And it was the experiences, the early experiences of the Cold War in 1947, 48, seeing what the Soviet Union was doing in Eastern Europe and other places around the world that led, and then the Korean War in 1950, that led the U.S. to conclude that um, whether it liked it or not, whether it wanted to be isolation, isolationist or not, that as a, a powerful country in the world, it had a responsibility to um, be strong and to stand up to the Soviet Union and oppose it. And so we had a, a strategy of containment. And um, 
One of the first documents that codified that came out in April of 1950 called NSC 68, and it, um, it relied on a very big conventional force buildup. But that was very expensive. And so three years later, when President Eisenhower came to office, he commissioned a secret study called Project Solarium uh, with three teams, Team A, B, and C. In charge of Team A, he put George Kennan, the author, the intellectual father of containment. Uh, team B, and he was supposed to make the case for why containment as it had been practiced so far was the right answer. Team B was supposed to make the case for a stronger containment that would confront the Soviets anywhere that they put their toe across the line uh, would meet them uh, with, with stiff uh, resistance. And Team C was to actually to, to make the case for why the U.S. should roll back Soviet advances that they had made since the end of World War II, so even more aggressive. And in July of 1953, Eisenhower spent all day in the White House with these teams, having them brief their cases, and then repeating back to them their arguments, explaining that he had heard, showing that he fully understood what they were saying, and then explaining to them why uh, Team A's answer was the best answer. That led to a document that replaced NSC 68, NSC 162-2 that was promulgated or not promulgated. It was a top secret document. It was kept close hold. But it came out in October of 1953. It's since been declassified. But in NSC 162-2, it makes the case for relying more on nuclear weapons and less on conventional um, arms because the U.S. simply couldn't afford it. Eisenhower was deeply worried about the state of the U.S. economy, uh, and he realized that we could bankrupt ourselves trying to pay for our own security. And you'll recall, of course, it was Eisenhower who, in his farewell address, warned of the military-industrial complex. Um, it was actually originally the military-industrial-congressional complex because Congress plays a big role in making sure that weapon systems get bought in their district but he didn't want to ruin the relationships between the White House and Congress, so he dropped the congressional part and just left it military-industrial complex. But he, you think about that, from his first year in office until his farewell address, he was very much focused on the potential of spending ourselves into bankruptcy and also of changing who we were. He was worried about becoming a garrison state who was so focused on security that we lost sight of our, our liberal democratic roots. So um, that brings us back to your point. How much is enough? Well, look, the, the U.S. Um, still produces roughly a quarter of the global GDP. No? Right? Give or take. Um, yeah, it's only 5% of the world population, but it, it still has vast interests around the world. It still produces quite a bit, and um, it's got to defend those interests. And you have to realize, too, that... Um, People in the United States complain that uh, our nuclear weapons are very expensive. And, of course, anything that costs in the billions of dollars, is, is, that's a big number. It's expensive. But it's, it's, a, it's about 6% of the defense budget. It's not that much. And through our extended deterrence guarantees, our nuclear weapons ensure that Japan don't get nuclear weapons, South Korea doesn't get nuclear weapons, it kept Germany from getting nuclear weapons in the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. There are over 30 countries that have um, this guarantee from the United States. And that has been one of the strongest... Uh, pillars of our non-proliferation policy over the decades, I would argue. I think there are countries that if they didn't have that U.S. guarantee or if they began to doubt the willingness of the U.S. to, to follow through, that, that they would very quickly go and get their own nuclear weapons. And we may see that if Iran gets nuclear weapons. I don't know that we can convince Saudi Arabia that we will give them the same kinds of protections that we gave during the Cold War to, to our NATO allies or to Japan or to South Korea. So um, it's, the defense budget is big. Uh, I'm not sure it's still growing. Uh, they've cut uh, hundreds of billions of dollars out of it. Um, there was a Budget Control Act that led to sequestration back in 2013. Um, but regardless of we, if whether we merely cut the rate of growth or if we actually cut the size, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a big number, um, and I don't know that it's avoidable. I don't, know that, I don't necessarily think it's too much particularly uh, nowadays when more and more of that budget goes to personnel costs and health care for the military and sort of social programs within the military. I don't know if that answers your question. But that's, that's Professor, one of the things that riles Indians is the hyphenation that we have with Pakistan in the eyes of the U.S. If you look at your own speech, you had one line vis-a-vis -vis the threat that India faces via, via China, 
and the entire speech was how do we protect ourselves against uh, pakistan which can which is nuclear do you think do you appreciate the indian view point at all and when do you think we would really begin to see the dehyphenation really take place including for example taking on board our concerns on afghanistan my i have quick other question if you were the iranian negotiator and were to look at the uh, negotiation vis-a-vis -vis us from the iranian view point would you not have the incentive to sign up the treaty and then find ways to renege on it given the fact that it is actually an enemy country that you are fighting with yeah so so to your first question i think if you go back and uh, look at my remarks i probably didn't mention pakistan until i was 20 minutes into the talk or or, or so um so not to quibble with you but uh but really it didn't i don't think it figured that largely um until the end until the end i i try to focus on south asia because i was asked to focus on south asia and um certainly um india's interest in getting nuclear weapons probably stemmed from the 1971 experiences uh concern about the us and its ability to intimidate uh but also because china had detonated nuclear weapons and I, and i think india's weapons program was and probably remains more focused on deterring china than it is about pakistan that's my belief um having said that there's no denying the tensions and the conflict and the crises that have occurred in south asia um and because i was asked to speak about it i did i did uh, focus a bit on the negative but possibilities um but don't take that as as um um meaning that i believe that there's still some view that the us should see the region as a uh, you know india hyphen pakistan i don't i think in fact it we started the evolution away from that um at at the latest in 2009 when obama came to office and appointed richard holbrook as his guy for afghanistan and pakistan and holbrook tried to make the case that hey we can't do this this doesn't make sense we got to consider india too so this should be you know my i'm the special representative i should be the special representative for afghanistan pakistan and india and in the indian government uh, made it clear in its own way that we're not interested in that uh, we're not part of any afghanistan pakistan india um, grouping uh, my, my my observation is that pakistan figures less and less in america's uh, relations with india and our dealings with india i mean more and more there is a flowering of defense cooperation uh, fdi um other strategic dialogues that go on um hopes for economic integration that uh, have little or nothing to do with pakistan um what's that yeah um i'm not sure what the 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 state of health is of those talks anyway i mean um india has done the responsible thing in 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 promising aid to afghanistan um and in in delivering on those promises uh in i think training some of the afghani police uh forces or security forces here in India um and I think the US welcomes that um I'm not really sure where where we're headed in in Afghanistan uh 6 months ago it seemed a foregone conclusion that we were going to get out of Afghanistan just as we got out of Iraq getting back to the question about whether we've learned I think we we did the questioner I think is gone he was sitting right here but the, 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 I think the fact that we have decided to keep more forces longer in Afghanistan shows that we are learning from what happened in Iraq right I mean if I think Americans recognize that we got out too quickly from Iraq we didn't stick around long enough to to um seal the victory or to 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 see it through and um and now part of the reason we have ISIS today is because of that and we could have the same sort of situation in Afghanistan if we pull out precipitately um but as to the talks with the Taliban um uh I tend to subscribe to the view uh that we we shouldn't necessarily have Pakistan involved in those talks I don't think they're on our side I don't think they have the same desired outcome I think they see Afghanistan as strategic depth for them they're worried uh about Indian encirclement and then having a government in Kabul that's friendly and tight with India somehow threatens them and so they want to keep a a government in Kabul that's more to their liking uh and that means one that's in and an, antithetical probably to India um so I don't I don't favor that but um 
I'm, I'm not a part of the U.S. government anymore. I mean, I, I do work for the Department of Defense at the War College, but but um, I'm not working in policy circles anymore. Um, so I don't know what the uh, argument is for keeping India out of those talks. Uh, I would also say I'm not sure that there's much value at all in those talks. Uh, I'm not sure who we're talking with. I'm not sure how, how uh, reconcilable some of those factions are. Um, so I don't know if that answers your, your question. And then on the Iran deal, um, I, don't, I don't think they're going to cheat. I don't think they're going to cheat. There's too much at stake, right? There's just too much at stake. They are um, even now getting um, tens of millions, if not more than 100 million, a billion rather, billions of dollars would be um, as a result of, of um, this deal. Um, why would they jeopardize that? I mean, 10 years seems like a long time looking forward. But looking back, 2005, 2006, that's not that long ago. So they... If they're smart, we'll abide by the letter of the law. They might try some things around the margins, but um, but I think by and large they'll stick to the agreement. The danger I see is 10 years from now, 15 years from now, will the international community still draw a hard line against Iran getting nuclear weapons? And I hope that they do. But I think there's some people who argue that the downside of this agreement is in some ways it sort of legitimates Iran so that if after 10 years they haven't, been caught cheating on the agreement, well, then they will have served their their time and and, um, and their then have somehow have been legitimized as a country that ought to be able to pursue nuclear weapons. I hope that's wrong. I hope that's wrong. But that's that's my view. I have a couple of questions. Now, the recent satellite sent by North Korea, suspected to be reconnaissance satellite. Yeah, the prelude to ICBM, targeted U.S. And what's your comment about it? And again, apart from the nuclear destruction that can happen because of the nuclear weapon, the connectivity between the politician and the military. If a cranky fellow just puts the switch on, then the same fellow on the other side also has to. And both will be, you know what will happen. In such a context, what type of strategy you envisage? Can there be any strategy at all? Yeah. Well, so, so, so a couple of really good questions. On the, uh, the North Korean missile launch, uh, it, it's, it's very disturbing, right? So the U UN has had um, Security Council resolutions against North Korea testing what is uh, seen as a stalking horse for an ICBM program, a missile program. Not, it's not a satellite program. Um, so it, it's concerning that they continue to develop means to deliver weapons at, at great distance. Um, and as far as strategy and how you go to it, uh, how, how do you how do you deal with this problem of nuclear weapons? Because as you say, um, uh, you can't count on rationality um, and and a perfect record forever. Deterrence can break down. It can break down in crises. Um, it can break down in, in conflicts that start out as conventional conflicts and then escalate. Um, and, it, and even rational actors, I mean, the, the whole deterrence theory, the classical literature on deterrence theory posits rational actors, but even rational actors will use nuclear weapons under certain circumstances. There's nothing irrational about it. If you're Kim Jong-un and you, and you sink another South Korean frigate, like they sunk the Chosun uh, back in 2010, and this time, South Korea says, that's the last straw. That's too much. Uh, and they hit back hard militarily. And things escalate. And the U.S. gets involved in the conflict. Um, it's easily imaginable um, that he could find himself in a situation where the most rational, most sensible thing to do would be to use nuclear weapons. Because what's the American way of war, right? We, we blind people. We take out their ability to see what's going on in the battlefield. We cut out their communication so they can't command and control their forces. Um, and we start bombing their command and control bunkers, where presumably some of the leaders might be. So if you're North Korea in this situation, and you're sitting there in your bunker, not able to communicate with your forces very well, and you're wondering if at any second some American bomb or missile is going to come slamming through there, you know that America doesn't need nuclear weapons to, to do regime change. Didn't use nuclear weapons in Iraq. 
didn't use nuclear weapons in Libya. So if I don't do anything different, if I'm Kim Jong-un and I just keep trying to fight back conventionally, my chances of survival might look like zero. So using a nuclear weapon might seem like a long shot, but compared to zero, a long shot is infinitely better than zero. Um, and so actually the rational thing to do is to use a weapon, and not only to use one, but to use it early before we take it out. Because the other thing America tends to do when it goes to war with somebody is prioritize very high their WMD systems that we know about. So you could, if you were Kim Jong-un, see yourself in a use or lose situation and feel that the most rational thing to do right now would to be a game, uh, pull a game changer and use a nuclear weapon in the hopes that even though it, it uh, only has a small chance of success, maybe it, it's enough to make America stop and say, okay, um, but if I do nothing but continue to fight back eventually, uh, I might think that I'm, I'm going to be uh, removed with all that goes with that. So what is the best strategy? Um, how do you deal with situations like that? And, and it's one of these things I've, I've often thought about writing an article on all of the paradoxes inherent in nuclear strategy and nuclear thinking. First off, is it even, uh, is it even a, a sensible to talk about nuclear strategy, right? So academics, uh, political scientists have, have debated for years whether it's an oxymoron, a contradiction of terms, nuclear strategy. To many people, use of nuclear weapons is completely astrategic. There's no strategy to it. There, if, if you use weapons in war, or war is supposed to be an instrument of statecraft to achieve political objectives, well, what political objective could possibly warrant the use of so powerful and destructive of weapons, right? Um, it gets back to the question about having such a strong defense. It's sort of paradoxical. If you want to keep peace, you need to prepare for war, and you need to be ready and strong. If you want to avoid nuclear war, I think you need to maintain a deterrent capability, and you need to work very hard at convincing anybody who might think about attacking you that you are utterly serious and sober in thinking about what you were going to do to them and so that they understood that if they ever even had any idea of attacking you with nuclear weapons, that they would realize uh, right away that that was a bad, bad move. So I, th I think that's the way you deal with it. That's the way we've dealt with it during the Cold War. Um, for the Soviet Union, they tried to seek a correlation of forces that in their minds would give them a psychological edge so that you wouldn't have to use the nuclear weapons, just having the preponderance of power and force. You could cow and intimidate members of NATO um, and, and have your way in, in the world. Uh, and the U.S. did its very best to make sure that no one in the Kremlin ever, ever thought that they had reached that point where the correlation of forces so favored Moscow that they could uh, be aggressive and be bold. Um, trouble with deterrence is it works on assumptions. You don't know if it worked or if they never had an intention to do anything or not. So uh, I, I tend to believe that deterrence worked um, and kept us from having that war in the Cold War and that it will going forward but it, we can't do it just the same way as we did in the Cold War. We need new, fresh thinking about deterrence, which is why I think this is such an important topic and which is why I'm so happy to be here talking with you about it today. Yeah. You had mentioned uh, uh, in your answers that uh, the U.S. did not have a particular strategy in, the, in a couple of countries uh, where they had withdrawn or whatever there was a so uh, regarding that, I think uh, they did have a certain strategy in trying to throw the Soviets out of Afghanistan, and they backed uh, Al Qaeda as is uh, Bin Laden and uh, created a monster called Al Qaeda, which in fact became a problem for the U.S. And then uh, you attacked, uh, you tried to de you dethroned um, Saddam Hussein in Iraq uh, on the uh, assumption that weapons of mass destruction, which would never existed there. So similarly, in Libya, Gaddafi was your uh, enemy number one for a very long time. And uh, then somehow he was also overthrown. And then all these regions have become destabilized. I, do you, don't you think that the, the Americans must think of a, have a pro proper strategy where if you're going to intervene, either directly or indirectly, 
in regime changes it would in fact be in american interest in the long run rather than creating more problems than you can solve yeah uh i would say we certainly did have a strategy in the cold war um in fact one of the um the other talks i've been giving one of the other talks i've been giving on on uh, this trip to india has been about us grand strategy and us national security strategy and uh i tend to subscribe to the view that in the cold war we knew how to do this um the reagan administration in 1982 published national security decision directive number number 32 um it was published in may or not published it was um produced in may of 1982 uh it was a top secret document the title of which was us national security strategy uh there were 36 copies made each individually numbered um and it guided the administration's uh, approach to the soviet union and it wasn't the reagan administration's intent to collapse the soviet union it was the reagan administration's intent to pressure the soviet union to get better behavior out of the soviet union from an american's perspective the 1970s looked like a decade of uh, endless soviet advances around the world in africa in central america um and uh in it going into afghanistan uh they were very aggressive in their disinformation program um uh, targeting the united states and from a american eyes it seemed like we had uh, come out of the vietnam war uh americans were sick of war americans had had lost a lot of confidence in themselves and um what the reagan administration wanted to do was to put pressure on the soviet union to get it to behave better um and um and to be less threatening um, there are those who argue that the steps that it took in implementing that strategy that i just mentioned and is dd32 that the steps that it took in implementing that strategy actually hastened the collapse of the soviet union um but i don't think that was ever the intent that goes back to my point earlier about when we teach our strategists about doing strategy we um try to get them to consider the risks of catastrophic success what if your strategy exceed or succeeds beyond your wildest expectations now going on to regime change um you you're absolutely right i mean one of the the strongest um Uh, uh what what are the strongest uh, incentives for countries to get nuclear weapons um is is if they fear conventional inferiority that's why pakistan has them uh, russia um used to have a no first use doctrine during the cold war but since then vladimir putin has been very very outspoken about going first with nuclear weapons uh, because he's trying to deter so a lot of people argue that the worst thing that the us has has done for proliferation is to overthrow Gaddafi after he gave up his nuclear program right um i can't speak to that i would just i would just suggest though that inherent in your question was this idea that um uh, america goes has gone around doing lots of these things and and i would just suggest that i see it a little bit differently uh, the the us had no nothing to do with what happened in tunisia which is where the arab spring got started that was a local situation built up over years and years right um i think you could say the same uh in syria um and the same in egypt i mean we we had no interest in overthrowing the mubarak regime regime i think what you're seeing is not the the acts of a, a strategy at work or us policy at work even what you see is developments in which the us has to decide whether to take a role or not and if it does take a role what that role should be um and in uh, egypt we chose to to abandon uh mubarak after decades of you know partnering partnering with him and and having a having an alliance with egypt so um uh same same within libya i don't think we purposely went about and decided to overthrow qaddafi but i think it came there came a point where qaddafi there was a civil war in libya and the human rights atrocities were to a level that the administration had to decide whether to do something about it or not. And they want to lead from the front so it led from behind. Remember that expression? Let its uh, some of its European allies 
take a, a more of a leading role in um, in trying to oppose Gaddafi's forces, and that eventually led to the actual overthrow of Gaddafi. Um, it didn't have to turn out that way. Remember, I mean, Gaddafi had a vote in this too. He could have, I suppose, left. So, um, yeah, the, the U.S. sometimes uh, intervenes or takes actions and, and then lives with second and third order consequences that were unintended, like a bin Laden. Um, but... Um, it's not, it's not clear to me that it's um, um, as easy looking forward to know exactly what to do as, as your question suggests it is in hindsight. Even in the case of Iraq, it's a, it's a popular narrative that we went into Iraq for WMD. Um, that was a big part of it, especially after 9-11. Uh, National Security Advisor uh, Condoleezza Rice said, we can't afford to let the next smoking gun be a mushroom cloud. But if you think about this, the first Gulf War ended in 1991. The invasion of Iraq happened in 2003. For over a decade, the UN Security Council, which we count on to try to keep peace and stability in the world, had passed resolution after resolution after resolution trying to make sure that Saddam did not develop WMD. Um, and I would just ask the, the audience to think about what would the world look like today had Saddam not been removed? I mean, the oil for food program, he was bringing in billions of dollars um, illicitly. He had completely co-opted some of our closest allies through money, I mean the greed of oil for food. Uh, and at the same time, he was getting rich and building palaces. He was starving the, the swamp Arabs, as they're called, the, the people that live down around Basra in the, in the southeast completely starving his people and then blaming the United States and buying up column inches of press in the Arab language press, saying, look what the Americans are doing and creating anti-Americanism across the region. At the same time, Saddam Hussein was paying money to the families of suicide bombers, Palestinians and others, for carrying out attacks in Israel. Okay? This is a man who had gone to war um, with two of his neighbors, unprovoked, and who had a long-term desire to have WMD. And he had essentially gotten to the point where the no-fly zones over his, his country that were imposed by UN Security Council resolutions had dwindled to just the US and the UK. France had finally pulled out, and it was a question how long the UK was going to do it. It's amazing to me I had friends flying in support of Northern Watch and Southern Watch in those no-fly zones over Iraq, that no one ever just had an accident, you know, mechanical accident, and ended up uh, a prisoner or a hostage of, of Saddam Hussein. Um, he waged war against his own people. He gassed the Kurds. So I think the world's a better place without Saddam Hussein. And I think had we let the sanctions on him, the regime collapse, uh, and not done anything about him, I think the world would be a lot different place today and not a better place for it. Because he was a dangerous man who sought to have control over lots of oil resources in the region. So... I don't mourn the loss of Saddam Hussein. I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure it was the right decision. Don't get me wrong. I'm not 100% sure it was the right decision in 2003. But I don't buy the argument that, oh, we didn't find the WMD that we thought were there, and so therefore it was a huge mistake. I don't buy that narrative. And I think 30 years hence, looking back, um, people will be less passionate about it, a little bit more objective about it, and they may have a, a um, different view than is commonly held today. Because the view that you expressed is commonly held in the United States, too. I just don't uh, share it entirely. Mark, uh, question before the last one. Uh, do you think the rogues of ISIS or Boko Haram or Ta Taliban have nuclear warheads in their heads right now? If not, when do you think that's going to happen? A, cor a corollary is, where do you think the next uh, nuclear explosions going to be, a bomb going to be? Ah, I, that, I wanted to ask the audience that question, right? Right. So so by 2050, will, it, will there have been another detonation by 2050? What do you think? By show of hands, who thinks there will be a detonation between now and 2050? Okay. Where? On the Indian subcontinent. I mean, there, there are people that worry that that's the case, that this is one of those flashpoints where it, it could be likely. Um, 
Uh, my guess is that it would be here or in um, on the Korean Peninsula. Korean, yeah, the Korean, Pen the Korean Peninsula or here. That, that would be my guess. Um, now, as to the the question about nuclear terrorism, um, I I don't worry about that so much. Um, and I'll, I'll give you just a, a, a little bit of uh, my thinking. It's not easy to get your hands on a, a nuclear device, right? States that go to the trouble of producing these things aren't likely to give them away. And I, I don't think it's within the means of uh, any terrorist organization to indigenously produce its own nuclear weapons. So if they get one, it's going to have to be stolen or given to them from a, a nuclear state, maybe in a situation like a, a collapse of Pakistan, or if there's an insider threat, a radical insider threat that somehow um, transfers uh, a weapon to them. But I don't, I don't worry about improvised nuclear explosives. In in the business of making nuclear weapons, you can um, probably improvise one based on uranium. That is, you can. You can design and manufacture without too much sophistication a bomb that's based on uranium. But separating uranium, getting highly enriched uranium, is very, very, very hard. It takes the resources of a state and lots of years and lots of technical know-how. Um, with plutonium, it's a different problem. Uh, the engineering of a bomb based on plutonium, it has to be an implosion device. Again, the engineering know-how that's required to... to get an implosion so that it actually gives you a, a big detonation is, um, is so complex that I don't worry about terrorists being able to improvise a plutonium device. So because it's so hard to get highly enriched uranium um, and because it's, it's virtually impossible to make uh, improvised nuclear explosive with plutonium, I don't worry so much about the, the terror threat. Um, I think we should keep an eye on it because they certainly would like to have it, but I, I think... Um, they will find that it's a lot easier to continue to carry out more conventional types of attacks than to get nuclear weapons. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bucknam, for a wonderful talk. Um, I have uh, one question, and it kind of led it on. I'm very happy that the question just leads into this, what we're talking about. I'm a materials engineer by profession, so I was going to ask you, somebody builds a bomb, there's a different strategy for that. But even before a country gets the capability to build a bomb, what kind of strategy does the United States have in terms of controlling the source of these materials? Because we know that they are not equally available across the globe. Yeah. And part B of my question is, how many nuclear warheads do you think India has? Yeah, so um, there are groups that make a full-time job of trying to find out secret information. They put in these freedom of information requests to the U.S. government, and they're constantly trying to ascertain uh, the answer to such questions. The, the, in the literature, the public literature, it's about 100 um, plus or minus 10 or 20 weapons is, is the estimate as to what India has. Same with Pakistan, although Pakistan seems to be building up much more quickly or trying to build up much more quickly. Um, but to the first part of your question, the U.S. has deposits, or Canada, which is very rich in uranium deposits, but doesn't have a nuclear weapons program and doesn't want to see others get it. Um, Russia, the U.S., many others are parts of the nuclear weapons um, or the nuclear suppliers group. Um, and these guys constantly are looking for people who are buying specialized materials and things that could be used in nuclear programs. Uh, there are certain kinds of steel that have very few uses outside of, of containment vessels for nuclear reactors and things like that. Um, so there's a network of countries that cooperate on this behind the scenes um, but it's a very difficult job, as, as A.Q. Khan proved. Right? He was able to find ways to buy, you know, have straw purchasers to, to buy things that uh, ostensibly for one purses, a purpose or to go to one destination and get them to uh, Pakistan and, and be able to um, develop a, a weapons program. But th the U.S. takes that very seriously. It always has. It's, it's led in um, trying to um, have different initiatives to stop proliferation, um, President Bush had something called PSI, uh, the Presidential Security Initiative, um, where countries willingly cooperate in trying to intercept on the high seas suspected cargoes uh, to get cooperation. For instance, say uh, somebody gets an Indian ship and they want 
and they're using it to smuggle missiles or nuclear material. Um, the U.S. Navy on the high seas can't intercept that, that ship without either the permission of the captain or the permission of the country under which it is flagged. So I don't know if India is part of the PSI. I should probably know that. But um, the idea would be that we could, if we, we knew of such a ship, the U.S. government could come to the Indian government and say, we want to search that ship uh, because we think it's carrying uh, contraband uh, uh, technology or, or materials. So uh, we work hard at that. President Obama, I mentioned some of the things that he did early in his minist administration. I did not mention he had a, a global summit on, on nu nuclear proliferation, nonproliferation, in Washington, D.C., where he invited heads of state. They've made uh, a, a lot of progress in trying to um, collect up highly enriched uranium that had been put around the world, way, some of this stuff going way back to the 1950s and 60s as part of the Atoms for Peace program that now sat, some of it unused, some of it at universities and research reactors and things like that in a physics department in Argentina maybe or someplace like that, and try to collect this stuff up and get better control on it and better securities. So that's the strategy that's been um, applied, and there's a, a, whole, a whole literature, a whole series of organizations that, that uh, try to promote that because it is a, such an important uh, Issue. Sir, uh, yeah, uh, the first and second uh, nuclear weapon strike happened in Japan. Yes. Now, the there is a school of thought which says that the third uh, nuclear strike is going to happen in the Indian subcontinent. My question is, what are the series of steps which India can take to make itself impervious to a nuclear attack? Yeah. Well... I don't know that any country can do anything to, to be truly impervious to a nuclear attack. Um, I think it makes sense to invest in defenses. Right? I mean, one of the things about missile defense, in the Cold War, it was seen as destabilizing. Um, but I think times have moved on. The good thing about missile defenses is that um, they're not offensive. Um, with deterrence, there's the whole question of your willingness to follow through. And so there's, there's maybe some doubt in an adversary's mind. But missile defenses actually deter. They don't just defend. They actually deter because there's this idea of deterrence by denial. If somebody wants to do something and you want to deter them from doing that, you can do it in two ways. You can deter them by threatening such terrible punishment after the fact that they won't want to do it. Or you can threaten to prevent them from succeeding in the first place so they will have showed their hand that they were trying to attack you, and they won't succeed at it. Now, even a suicide bomber wants to get to the target. Even a suicide bomber doesn't want to blow him or herself up in the middle of an intersection and kill nobody else but themselves, which is how law enforcement works. When law enforcement gets indications that there's a heightened threat, they do things that make terrorists believe that they are under surveillance and will be detected and will be caught. And that actually deters. They do it in law enforcement all the time, not just for nuclear things, um, but, but law enforcement for crime and for terrorism. That's a, a principle of deterrence. It's called a deterrence by denial. So missile defense has the benefit of adding to your deterrence in peacetime, deterrence by denial, um, but also potentially helping if deterrence fails. And particularly if it fails, it fails in a small way where it's just um, an unauthorized attack or an accidental launch. So that's one thing we can do. The other thing to do is to think about it. I mean, really seriously, one of the problems with deterrence today is nobody wants to think about it. It's, such, it's so horrible to contemplate, right? It's, it's human nature. Nobody wants to contemplate nuclear Armageddon. But you need serious people somewhere in your government who, who can advise uh, civilian political leaders, and you need civilian political leaders who are willing to listen and contemplate and take the time to consider this. We had that in the Cold War. But I think what makes nuclear um, risks today more frightening is that who thinks that Xi Jinping has thought about nuclear weapons for 10 minutes? You know, He wakes up in the morning. He's not even thinking about foreign policy. He's worried about control at home. He's worried about instability at home, right? You know, Prime Minister Modi, right? He's no shrinking violet. I'm sure he's strong on defense. He was in Visag uh, yesterday talking about having strong maritime posture and all, right? But, uh, you know, how much time out of his day does he think about nuclear deterrence and how it works and what he would do in a crisis? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the rumor is back in the United States, you know, presidents for years since the Cold War. Reagan was the last president who actually took part in high-level nuclear war games and exercises. Right? 
Does President Obama spend time thinking about how to, to deter? That's, one, that's a, a great concern. So I think part of the answer to your question is we need um, a public debate. We need people to think about it, as unpleasant as it is. Um, and we need to, to try to come up uh, with, with uh, policies and not bury our head in the sand and have uh, dreams or fantasies about disarmament that really are headed nowhere. Uh, I think we need to confront reality as it is, not as we wish it would be. Thank you.